bloggers are blogging, journalists are reporting. We are the rigid gentlemen who are preachers. We preach for a more elegant life. People have a strange image of that. It's just about glamour and smoke screens and perturbated designers. This is not my field. My field is about craftsmanship, artisans, all the gestures. And all of a sudden, this came into my life as an inspiration. Crafting a suit, a bespoke suit, by hand, requires 60 to 80 hours, two to three fittings. It's a long process. If it's really industrial, the same suit with the same fabric can be crafted in probably 45 minutes. People are coming back to some tradition, but in my opinion, it's even more, it's even deeper than that. My strong belief is that people are in search of a spiritual experience to buy something that will survive them. Oltre il gusto, la sensibilità. To do this kind of job, you need to be sensitive. You need to be passionate. You need to understand it. I've not been raised at all in a luxury world or in the fashion world. I'm from a humble family typical middle-class French family. I have memories of my grandfather, the shoemaker. I was fascinated by the tools that he was using. And my mother was a seamstress. I had a long career before as a freelance artist, as a stage designer, as a director. So I've been doing all sorts of different things, but with the, always the same idea, do things that I want to do. Don't let anyone interfere with my life. The moment I really deep dive in this handcraft, artisanal thing was around 2007. I became totally uh, uh, interested and almost obsessed by everything that was handmade. And so I wrote, let's say, 10 articles about bespoke suit making, and I said, okay, I'm going to call this Parisian gentleman. The first day I had 17 readers. After a couple of weeks, I searched my name on the web and I discovered to my surprise that my blog was one of among the top 10 fastest growing blogs in the world. We try to explain to a new generation of gentlemen why it is important, of course, to dress well and to be at your best in your life, but also people are start to be thirsty again for some more personalized thing. Every shirt is made one by one. Yes. And all the shirts are different. Of course. The world is going so fast right now, and this all this is a school of patience because even yes. weaving this kind of fabric is extremely slow. You don't just buy a shirt, you buy a tradition. I think that people start to have enough of the ready-to world in which we live. Ready to wear, ready to eat, ready to think almost. And I believe it's a reaction to this mechanized, industrialized world. If you buy something and you don't know what is behind all the tradition, all the expertise, all the know-how, all the suffering, all the hours, this is called vulgarity for me. Just buying this because you have the money, this is vulgarity. Now, on the other hand, if you do the same thing, but you understand what is behind, you understand the tradition, you understand the gesture, then all of a sudden, the experience changes, and it connects you to something that is bigger than your own life. I believe that the people I write for, the people I speak to, they rediscover the virtues of waiting, the virtues of 
humility because there's a huge paradox in this book. When you are in the fitting room with a tailor, no matter if you are a prince or the simple guy around the corner, when the tailor is measuring you, he knows every detail of your body. That's a very humble experience. I had this intuition that we were part of something way bigger than what we see. So I started reading on my own different things, losing myself in some researches. I found some cults. All these practices had basically the same thing. You are God and you have to believe in yourself and in your potential. People need some spirituality. They need something that is larger than life. When they don't see it in religion, they find it everywhere they can. The common denominator of all this is that at the end, always, that was disappointment. We are, all of us, we are sinful, not loyal. That's the nature. The only thing I ended up was confusion. I still had this idea that something bigger was embracing us, but I couldn't find my way. I clearly remember one day, I was in a difficult situation, even taking a little bit of drugs. And I remember one night, I was so desperate, as if the sky was closed, as if my universe became meaningless. And that's the first time I directly spoke to the Lord. Well, sir, if you do exist, that's the moment to send me signs because I'm really struggling with my life. I'm, I'm not happy. I needed this sense of purpose for my life. And I mean, making money, doing films, all of this was not enough. One day in 2011, I received a tweet from this woman saying, I'm an American journalist. I'm interested in what you do. Hugo and I actually met on Twitter. So that was a very short introduction. Hugo is an author and he is a, a voice on men's style. I had asked him if he needed someone to write for his publication from a woman's perspective. I don't know, four or five days later, he wrote back. We started to exchange a few ideas on the subject. And then later on, she, she flew to Paris to meet me. This was a man who was just very open and presented himself exactly as he was, and I felt that was really an honest approach. There's a woman from Georgia that you see, and immediately it's like the sky is opening for both of us, and we say, that's it. We have to move forward together. Sonia is the granddaughter of a preacher. She's coming from a very intense Christian family. I'm an intellectual, you understand? I'm a writer. Bible was too simple for me in the parents. You know why it was too simple for me? Because I, I didn't read it. We French, you know French? We still believe we invented pretty much everything. And these people, like we call them the Lumière, the lights. These are the people who were against the church, you know, Voltaire and Diderot. We created the encyclopedia. We made the, the French Revolution. So we believe we are, we are the, the best people. We still believe we can save the world. What is your story about Jesus Christ and the guy who turns water into wine? Well, we do wine every day in France. We don't, you know, I'm joking, but that was the way I was looking at those things. And our main struggle was about the nature of Jesus. For me, he was a, a great guy, but just like many other great guys. And she's been, you know, pushing me to understand that he was not just so fat, he was the son of God. That makes a whole difference. Mm -hmm. 
We were in Milan. I was already working on my next book. So we entered this flat we were renting with my wife, Sonia, and there was a kneeling bench in front of us, like an antique. And then a few days after, I came to Sonia and I said, I found on the internet something called the sinner's prayer. Can we say this prayer out loud? We used this bench and I did this, I read this sinner's prayer out loud. A few weeks later, I decided to buy my first Bible. And from that moment, we started to read the New Testament out loud every day. I needed her guidance and her advice to really understand. I started to change deeply inside, to surrender, to, to switch from my intellectual way of reading things and to a, a more let them work inside, inside myself. This is a very special I came to America for the first time in 2013 to meet my new family. Her sister, Sharon, she's a member of the Church of the Apostles. She has been talking to me so many times about this Egyptian-born preacher, Dr. Youssef. I've never been in a Protestant church, you understand? So I entered this. Uh, it's like entering the Madison Square Garden for me. I said, what is that? Living generously means that your ultimate hope and your ultimate confidence and your ultimate trust is not in these, but in the Lord your provider. When you totally trust in Him alone, you will never be disappointed. You know why? Because He never fails you. The first sermon I heard from Yusef was about something I could relate to. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Church of the Apostles. All the way down to Being the less selfish, Jesus this Christ is made. talking to me on, on a deep sense. My brother-in-law is a very crafty guy. And uh, we had a good relation immediately. And he said to me, um, oh, Hugo, I have a project. We have a small pond in our family place in Blue Ridge in Georgia. And he said, I have this project to, to build a dock on the small pond. We recuperated some old telephone poles that can weigh probably, I would say, 400 pounds, maybe more. And we put this inside the water. I've never built anything with my hands my whole life. Everybody was laughing, I fell in the pond. And during all these moments, we were just him and me. And he talked to me about the time he was born again, so he explained to me those things, you know, to empty yourself of yourself and to make room for the Holy Spirit and Jesus. It wasn't about religion. It was really just about Christ transforming his life. And he did it in a very soft and mild way. And I guess he planted more seeds, you know, to grow with the go Spirit. I wanted to deep dive. So I asked to go to another service. And that was a more tough one for me because I was speaking about the cross. How can a secular mind accept that the only way to save your life is by surrendering it? In order to be great, you must humble yourself. How can the God of limitless power hung helplessly on a cross? And so Joshua did something for Hugo that had never been done for him before. He prayed specifically for Hugo and what he was going through in his life. And in that moment, I began to address God as Father, and I prayed a specific prayer over Hugo. He saw someone communicating to God with intimacy that he hadn't seen before. I didn't realize the impact that that prayer had on him. I've ne never experienced this, somebody praying out loud putting your name in front of you. For you guys, it might sound so simple, so usual. You do this on a daily basis. And I immediately felt the power of praying. We thank you that there is an inward reality where your Holy Spirit has taken up residence in his heart. I converted at this very moment. The light came through. I knew I was on this way forever. And from this moment, I started to 
go to the church as much as I could because I was living in Europe, so I was just a couple of months in Atlanta. And then I started to listen to Dr. Youssef. Everything I could grab from him, I was grabbing. I have some series that changed my life. The 12 Evidence for Faith is a recent one. That was a strong one. The Master Manifesto is probably my favorite of all the, of the Beatitudes. And seeing that, our business and our life has totally changed. In Proverbs 8, it says, those who diligently seek me will find me. The Lord so struck him that the evidence of his faith was undeniable. Hugo's acceptance of Christ changed everything. I found and he found peace. Recently, Hugo told me that he wanted to be baptized. We are believing that we have died to ourselves and we are alive in Christ. Hugo, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and atoned for your sins? Yes, I do believe. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yeah, He is my Lord and Savior. Hugo, by that profession of faith and in front of these witnesses, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> It was like the death of the old Hugo and the, and the Renaissance and the, the new birth of the new Hugo, emptying my, myself of myself to, to make some room for the Holy Spirit and for Christ to work through me. It was just uh, like oxygen, and I know it was the Spirit of God. Joshua spoke to Hugo and he asked him if he was willing to suffer for Christ. And I think that just must have been a Holy Spirit inspired question. I live in a country which is secular. It's written in the constitution that you don't have the right to speak openly about your religion. In my area, when you say you're a Buddhist, you're cool. When you say you're a Christian, People step back, physically. I think that all that had happened to me during these last five years with Parisian gentlemen was for a good reason. That I had to do what I'm doing now in front of people. And I'm very proud to do this and I'm very happy and I feel blessed to have the opportunity to talk to my fellow friends, and to say that God is the way. The responsibility and the influence is another meaning for me now. I feel the call to minister to my community, even if some people will not understand what I say. I want to serve. Today, in the presence of our Heavenly Father and these family and friends, we affirm your continued commitment, both now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord was faithful in revealing himself to Hugo. It's never too late. At 52 years old, he gave his life to the Lord. The gospel transcends culture, language, country. It doesn't matter. The gospel cuts through all of that. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in, in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That resonates a lot in me. Ils sont à leur bureau, enlever leurs souliers. We are talking in the bespoke world about creating something unique. When you encounter an artisan, those people who are working so hard to create masterpieces, that is very close to what is written here. This suit has been made for me by a, by a craftsman, and there's only one, and there'll only be one exactly like that. 
now I can connect this very clearly with the Bible and Jesus Christ. The Lord created us one by one. In the ready-to-wear industry, when there's a stitch which is not totally straight, the product is rejected. In bespoke, something that is made by hand will not be straight. The artisan who creates this is doing it by hand because he knows exactly who he is doing this for. This imperfection becomes part of our identity. As if we have been taken this subject of style and craftsmanship as a pretext to say something else. God is a master artisan. He is an artisan of each of us individually. It took me over 52 years to realize all this and to just surrender. The whole thing is not to be happy. The whole thing is to receive grace and to be thankful and to walk each day in the light of Jesus Christ.